Eucharistia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for our salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the test so that the yeah, okay so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ though you have not seen him you love him though you do not know him though you do not know you see him you believe in him and rejoice in with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let's pray. Father, we again thank you for all here. We thank you for all in internet land. We just ask that by your spirit you would control us so we would be pleasing in your sight. We ask as our pastor comes, David, to give us your message as he has studied so diligently through the week, that you would uh, open up our hearts, our minds, to understand your word, but more importantly, through the power of your spirit, to put it into practice. Amen. Okay, Alyssa, you ready to give me some competition here? How are we all doing today? Um, I, got, I got a request for those of you that pray, okay? And hopefully it's all of you, but some people don't put a lot of importance on prayer. I do. But I need your help. Um, my best friend Rob is in, a, in the hurt locker right now. He fell and broke his wrist two months ago. They casted it. He needed surgery, but they couldn't give him surgery because he's on blood thinners. They casted it. They took the cast off last week and put some kind of thing on it, and he's in intense pain. And they're not giving him enough drugs to take the pain away. It kind of knocks it down a little bit, but he's going to have surgery on that wrist on Tuesday. But just pray with me that he didn't make it to Tuesday. I mean, he is in intense pain. And this man has been in pain constantly for the last seven years, so he knows pain, but this, he said this is the worst pain he's ever experienced at home, meaning in the hospital he's had worse, but... And the hospital just, you know, he went in the hospital last week to do some, to check some things before surgery, and they wouldn't give him any pain medicine. And they had to sign a waiver when they went in the hospital saying it is a federal offense to harass the staff or be mean to the staff. I'm like, if you have to put, if people have to sign something before they go into hospital, why are people being mean to the staff? I think there's probably a reason for that, okay? So, but his wife had to finally, she just went out there and went to the nurse's station and just raised Cain. She told him, he needs some pain medicine now. And finally got some. I'm surprised she didn't get arrested, but no, yeah. <laughs> Rob was happy that she didn't go to jail, but please, please just pray with me for him. And also pray for my friend Doug. Doug had his leg amputated and he's in the process of healing from that now. And, you know, I'm sure he's anxious to get a prosthetic on there, but that takes time. You know, the wound's got to heal and then you got to, build up a tolerance and whatever, but Doug will be at the conference. He's really excited about being there, so uh, look forward to that. Let, let's pray for these men right now, please. Father, we thank you for your love for us, Lord. I know it's beyond understanding how much you love and care for your children, Lord, and when we see our brothers and sisters dealing with so much pain, Lord, it, it saddens us, and it, it causes us to question, Lord, why? Why do they have to suffer so? Lord, I ask that you would just relieve this pain for Rob, as only you can do, Lord. I pray for Doug and his healing, Lord, that he would just heal up and be able to get back doing the things he loves to do. 
Lord, we pray for Rob's surgery on Tuesday. You just help him to get to that day, Lord. Help him with this pain to deal with it until he can make it to that surgery. Lord, thank you for your incredible love for us. We rest in it, Father. Amen. All right, people, it is finally out, okay? It is finally out. Now, this I don't know how long ago was it I got the book. That was a couple of months ago, I guess, right? Well, Jeff redid the cover, did a great job. Um, yeah, this, this bar won't be here. This is, this is a preview copy that Amazon sent me. So when you get a copy, it won't have that dumb bar there. But, uh, but it's up on Amazon now. You can get it in Kindle. You can get it in paperback on Amazon. And uh, I'm gonna, I ordered a bunch of copies myself, so we'll have some here and have some for the conference. <clears throat> but it is up. Now, once I got it, I went through it, read through the whole thing and made changes because, you know, I keep changing what I believe. So I had to... <laughs> You know, I always said if I write a book, if I ever write a book, it'll be on the feast. But the problem and the reason I hadn't was because I keep seeing more things. I keep learning. And, I, you know, you want to add everything you know. And now I have stuff that I want to edit this book on because I found out some stuff that I want to add to it. So, but at least it is out now. So if you, it's on Amazon. Your second book. Yeah, no, I'm just going to go in there and edit. I can edit right from Amazon, can't I? No. Okay, so yeah, it's a it's a project. They want to make it a project. <laughs> Third edition. <laughs> well, that's it's a, such a, a, a probably the most enjoyable study I ever done. Probably the most study that I probably learned more from that study than anything else. And it was just it was supposed to be a one message when I did it the first time, <laughs> and I did it, and I was like, well, I don't have to split this into two, and then it ended up being. I don't know, eight or ten messages, so uh, it's actually ten chapters in the book. I added another chapter also and made some changes, so it's hopefully, well, it was current two, two months ago, so <laughs> that's why I'm not so excited about writing books. All right, all right, let's get to it, people. We are moving on today to verse two, okay, so we're making some good progress. <laughs> don't shake your head at me. <laughs> we're making some good progress. We, uh, we actually finished up um, verse 1 last week, and uh, <clears throat> we focused our attention last week on the subject of election. Peter says, an apostle of Yeshua the Christ to those who are elect, exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, the word elect here signifies picked out or chosen. Cho it's often translated chosen. You were chosen. Chosen. Chosen for what? Well, the idea emphasizes two things. A choosing and a separation. In other words, because one has been chosen, he is separated from those who are not chosen, all right? Now, the term elect or chosen is synonymous with Christian or saved. He just uses that term instead of Christian many times in the Scripture. And the rich reality of that term is to remind us that we are chosen by God. He made a choice. Now, differing views on the doctrine of election have created a huge divide in the Christian world. More people over the 28 years we've been in existence here, more people have left this church over the doctrine of election than preterism, okay? People can put up with God already coming, but they're not putting up with him being a boss, okay? That's just not happening. No, we're not going to do that. He's not in charge. So bottom line, this is what the Bible teaches. Like it or not, the doctrine of election is subject that is frequent theme of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. It's just, the Bible's loaded with it. And every time I read the Bible, I see more and more of the sovereignty of God. In Genesis 12, God had just had this, had his fill of the nations and just gave up. Said, I'm done with all you people. I'm finished with you. Hand you over to the lesser gods. I'm moving on. In Genesis 12, he chooses Abraham, one man, out of a city of idolaters, and he promised to work through him to bring his salvation to the nations. Nehemiah 9.7 says, You are Yahweh, the God, who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldees and gave him the name Abraham. The word chose here is the Hebrew Bahar. Bahar is used over 160 times in the Tanakh. In the Septuagint, it is translated... Hey, hey, young lady, calm down. In the Septuagint, it's translated ek lego. And it simply means to choose. 
Well, what did Yahweh choose Abraham for? Well, he chose him to be a blessing. He chose him to be part of Yahweh's family. He chose him to enter into a covenant with him, a unilateral covenant of redemption. Now, he didn't choose Abraham's entire city. He didn't even choose Abraham's entire family. He chose Abram. He didn't choose anybody else from Asia, Africa, or Europe. He refused to choose Abraham's son Ishmael, and he chooses Isaac. And then he rejected Isaac's son Esau, and he chose Jacob. And Isaac and Jacob were both listed in Hebrews 11, 20 as saying to, they had faith. They were listed in the hall of faith as believers. Now, a question we need to ask is, why do we need to be chosen? Why does God have to choose people? I thought we're supposed to choose him. Well, Yeshua answers that question in John 6, 44. He says, no one can come to me. That's what it means in the Greek and the Hebrew and whatever else you put it in. It just means no one can come. Now, there's an exception, unless the Father sent me draws him. All right, so no one comes unless Yahweh draws. Paul puts it this way <clears throat> in Romans 3, 10, and 11. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. Because someone's going to say, well, what about? No, not one, nobody, okay? No one understands. No one seeks for God. Paul's here, he's quoting Psalm 14, 2. The word seek here means to seek after God, to go after Him. Now, while there are many who claim to seek God, there is no one who by nature seeks God wholeheartedly with determination. You know, what's interesting to me, there's a lot of churches out there today that call themselves seeker-sensitive. Well, they're not sensitive to anything because there's no seekers, because nobody seeks after God. The church is just built on a false premise. Seeking God is antithetical to the human disposition. We seek pleasure. We might seek religion, we might seek happiness, good times, but we don't seek God in the sense of seeking His holiness, His pleasure, His righteousness, His face. Among all these people in churches and temples all around the world, there is none that seeks God. No, not one. Now that's what the Scripture says, and that's amazing. The natural heart of man is not really looking for God, and this is why we must be chosen. God must choose us because we would never choose Him. The only time a sinner ever seeks God is when God first seeks that sinner, as we see in John 6, 44. Now, many people, even many Christians, doubt this is true. We may secretly think that millions of people are seeking God the best way they know how, but Paul says, no, man left to himself never seeks God. He just doesn't do it. But what seems to really upset folks is that God doesn't choose everybody. He chooses some and not others. Paul talks about that in Romans 9, 10 through 13. He says, and not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they had not yet been born and done nothing, either good or bad. Okay, these are unborn people. <laughs> now, why did he do that? Why did he choose them before they were born? It says, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of Him who calls. She was told, the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. Now, people don't know that verse is in there. Now, in Jewish society, the oldest was always chosen to receive the blessing and the inheritance. But in God's economy, it's always a work of grace. It's unmerited favor. God chose Jacob not based on anything he had done for the twins, Jacob and Esau, weren't even born when he chose them. It says he chose them in order that the purpose, God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, in other words, anything they did, but because of him who calls. So God selected the younger brother to receive the blessing. In the same way, election is a mystery to us. It's based on God's sovereign right as king, not based on anything that we have done. Now, often people in Western countries who have never been under an absolute monarch, they chafe at the thought of this, you know. I mean, this is not right. This is not democracy, they proclaim. Well, you're right, it's not. You're under a monarchy. 
God is a king. He's the absolute ruler. He does what he wants because it's right. And here we see God choose based on his right. Scripture everywhere declares that God is king and he does what he wants. That's what you can do when you're God and you create everything. You can do whatever you want because he's God. God is God. He does what he wants. Look how Paul responded to those who seem to struggle with this concept of election. I mean, Paul's teaching and people are getting upset. Oh, that can't be right. How does that happen? How, how can that be fair? He says, so then, he has mercy on whoever he has mercy. That's exactly what it says. He gives mercy to who he wants to. It's not, God's not bound to give mercy to everybody. He's not. And he'll harden whoever he will. So some he hardens, some he gives mercy to. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault who can resist his will? See, the imaginary objector here gets it. You can't resist his will. So why would he blame us? How can I be blamed for my unbelief? He hardened Pharaoh, and Pharaoh did just what he wanted him to do. He could not resist God's will. No man can. So why does he find fault and punish sinners? Listen carefully. There'd be no room for this objection, or that of verse 14, if Paul had been teaching that God chooses based on the conduct of men. There's no, there's no room for this argument, all right? It's very evident, that, therefore, that he was teaching no such doctrine, all right? How easy would it have been to answer the charge of injustice by saying, God chooses one, rejects another according to works of faith? The only reason this question arises is because Paul is teaching so clearly that God chooses one and he rejects another based solely on his own will. On his own will. And the destiny of men is determined by the sovereign pleasure of God alone. Have you ever asked the question, if God is sovereign and has decreed from all eternity, whoever, whatever takes place in time, how can I be held responsible for what I do? A lot of people ask that question, right? Who can resist his will? Nobody can. And if you've ever asked that question, it's because you understand that the Bible is teaching he's absolute sovereign, he does what he will, and yet you are responsible. I've heard that question raised many times. Well, the text goes on to say, has the, has the potter no right over the clay to make out of a same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? How would we answer? Does the potter have right over the clay? Can he do whatever he wants to with the clay? Does the clay object and say, wait a second. I don't want to be a doggone bowl. I want to be a vape. No, it doesn't. If it did, the potter would just go, let's start over, okay? <clears throat> God is creator. As creator, he is sovereign over everything, and he has the right to do whatever he chooses. All right. <clears throat> let's go back to Peter. As we go into verse 2, Peter goes on to explain their election in great detail by three prepositional phrases, all right? He says this in verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Yeshua, the Christ, and for sprinkling with His blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. What do you see in that verse? Anything stands out? Let me help you. You ready? Now what do you see? The Trinity, thank you. The Trinity is actively seen here. We have God the Father, we have the Spirit, we have Yeshua. Now, I know the word Trinity is not a biblical term, but the Trinity is, is not mentioned in Scripture, but in many unified texts, they bring these three together. Paul, or Peter, uses a Trinitarian formula to explain how Christians are called to faith. He says, the Father chooses, the Spirit sanctifies, sets apart, and the Son laid down His life. Mark demonstrates this triune God in Mark 1, 9 through 11. In those days, Yeshua came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came out of the water, immediately he saw heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you're my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. So here we have the Spirit, we have a voice coming from heaven, that's the Father, and then we have the Son. Let's talk for a minute about the Trinity. It seems that when some people come to the truth of the preterist view of eschatology, they want to throw out all Christian doctrine and start from scratch. They just want to, let's just start over. You know, it's ridiculous, I think. 
I don't know why our eschatological view has to change the fundamentals of the faith. But one of the doctrines that seems to be attacked by some preterists is the doctrine of the Trinity. They want to go after that, you know. And again, as I said, the word Trinity is not found in the pages of Scripture, but it's a doctrine that is taught throughout Scripture, all right, both in the Tanakh and in the New Testament. Trinity is a word used to express the unity of God subsisting in three distinct persons. It's a word describing the unity of the Godhead as three co-eternal, co-equal persons, each having the same substance while being distinct persons. It's a word that describes a purely revealed doctrine that is indiscoverable by reason, but clearly taught in Scripture. As Christians, we affirm that there's one eternal being known as Yahweh. Yet this one eternal being exists in three individual persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Logically, in our minds, we can't easily understand how one being can exist in three persons. Yet the Bible clearly teaches that. All right, Christians affirm both to be true. In the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith, chapter 2, paragraph 3, states this. In this divine and infinite being, there are three subsistences, the Father, the Word, or the Son, the Holy Spirit, of one substance, power, and eternity, each having the whole divine essence, yet the essence undivided. The Father is of none, neither begotten nor proceeding. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father, the Holy Spirit is proceeding from the Father and the Son. All infinite, without beginning, there, uh, without beginning, hang on to that thought, we're going to come back to that. Therefore, but one God, who is not to be divided in nature and being, but distinguished by several peculiar relative properties and personal relations. Which doctrine of the Trinity is the foundation of all communion with God and <clears throat> comfortable dependence on Him? Now, the Trinity, I think, is one of the distinctive doctrines in Christianity. It's a doctrine that has been under attack since the third century. In the first decade of the 3rd century, the Alexandrian priest Arius began teaching the heresy that the son, if the son was a real son, then the father must have existed before him. Therefore, the divine father must have existed prior to the divine son, and the son, therefore, is created by God. He's a created being. Christ would be a created being. He declared that the son was the greatest and eldest of all God's creatures and was himself a God but still created and therefore was like all creatures of the essence or substance which previously had not existed. Now Arius clashed with Alexander, the bishop of Alexandria, who believed that the co-eternality of the Word of God, and he refuted Arius' teaching that the Word was created by God. In Arius' words, there was a time when he, the Son, was not. And that's, if he wasn't an eternal being, then that would be true. The Arians inferred from this that Christ, though existing before the world, as a creature of the Father. So he was created by God, but he was there from the beginning. Now because Alexander understood this as a dangerous threat to the church, he publicly condemned Arius' teaching and removed him from all church posts. This led to the calling of the first ecumenical council, the Council of Nicaea. At this council, Arius' teaching was formally condemned. The debate on this lasted from May 20th, A.D. 325, until June 19th, A.D. 325, and produced an initial form of the Nicene Creed, which condemned Arianism and established the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, contrary to popular belief, the Trinity is not a New Testament invention. It was an idea taught throughout the Tanakh. If you look at Isaiah 63, we see Yahweh... Then we see the angel of Yahweh, which is the Son, and then we see the Holy Spirit. So in that text, we have all three members of the Godhead. And as I said, the, the Trinity is not an invention of Christians. Many people think, well, that's just Christianity made that up. This was well known in Middle Judaism. The Israelites believe that the second power is Yahweh's essence manifests in a different form. This is the basis of binatarianism in Jewish thought. And later, the Spirit of God is spoken of in that same way in Isaiah 63. So, here's what's really important, people. To deny the Trinity is to deny the deity of Christ. 
And anyone who denies the deity of Christ is not a believer in my understanding. You cannot deny the deity of Christ. Now that may sound a little strong, but the Bible clearly teaches that Yeshua is Yahweh. To deny the deity of Christ is to deny that He is in fact Yahweh in the flesh. It's to be dead in your sins. Now if that's too strong, you blame Christ because that's what He said. I told you that you would die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am, the word He is not in that text, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. The truth is that Yeshua is Yahweh. It's taught from the very first verse of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with the Father. So important, and that's why the attack on the Trinity is so deadly, because it destroys the deity of Christ. It makes Him just a created being. All right. Now let's look at these three prepositional phrases that we see in verse 2. The first one being, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. And we have to stop here and ask the question, what is according to the foreknowledge of God the Father? According is the Greek preposition kata, which takes us back. And it takes us back to those who are elect exiles according to the foreknowledge of God. This, is, this ties election with foreknowledge. They're elect according to foreknowledge. Now, Boy, when you talk about foreknowledge, you open up a can of worms, of course, also. Some understand foreknowledge is God, just God's knowledge, okay? And God has His knowledge, and what God does is He looks into the future to see what you will do. Let me see what Stan's going to do down there. Okay, Stan's going to trust me, I'll trust him, I'll choose him. Well, that's, you know, first of all, you got God gaining knowledge through observation, okay? <laughs> that does not happen, okay? If he's gaining knowledge, he's not omniscient. And that's not the God of the Bible. This would mean that election is not really election at all. This would be a cause and effect arrangement basing God's choice on man's. You chose, so, oh, I'll choose him because he chose me. Well, then how's God doing any choosing at all? Okay, But that's how many would look at foreknowledge. The word foreknowledge is the Greek noun prognosis. It is used, only used here and in Acts 2.23. And we'll look at Acts in a minute here. The verb prognosco is used in 1 Peter 1.20, so Peter uses the, the noun and the verb, and it's also used in Romans 8.29. So let's look at uh, prognosco here, how it's used in 1 Peter 1.20. Speaking of Christ, Peter says, He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. Now, does this mean foresight here? Does it mean that God was up in heaven looking down the road and saying, oh, I see what Christ is going to do. I get it. No, God's not looking in the path of history and seeing anything, okay? He knows everything. He created everything. He's ordained everything, all right? Well, prognosis, whatever prognosis means in verse 2, it means in verse 20. Peter is not trying to confuse us. He's not trying to say, I'll use it here this way and I'll use it there that way. If Christ was foreknown before the foundation of the world, and I was chosen before the foundation of the world, according to Ephesians 1.4, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him in love. Now, the word chose here is the, the Greek ekalegomai. This is the same word that we saw used earlier in Nehemiah 9.7 of Abram, all right? Now, listen. He says they were chosen to be what? Holy and blameless. What does that mean? Is he talking here about they're supposed to act that way? Is that what he's talking about? No, he's dealing with their position here. He chose us before the foundation that we should be holy. The only way you're going to be holy is to be in Christ, all right? So these people were chosen to be in Christ. Now, does election have a connection to foreknowledge? Yeah, it really does. And we'll look at that in a couple minutes here. But this tells us that I was foreknown in the same way that Christ was foreknown. Now, let's go to Acts 2 and see what he says in Acts 2, 23. This Yeshua, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. All right? Peter likes this word. He uses it several times. All right? Christ was delivered up to die by the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. And here we see that the foreknowledge is linked to the definite plan. 
when applied to God's foreknowledge of persons, whether of Yeshua or people, foreknowledge is more than merely something that we know beforehand, all right? It involves choice or determination as well. Mainly, it involves love. To know in Scripture, when God talks about knowing something, He's talking about not just a knowledge of something, He's talking about a covenantal love. He sets His love on somebody. He sets His affection on somebody. We could translate for no as for love, in a sense that God determined in eternity past to set his sovereign and distinguishing affection on those who deserved only eternal death. I think that the way that Paul uses the verb prognosco in Romans 8 will really help us determine what Peter means by this, because this is, this is pretty strong here, how he uses it in Romans 8, 29 through 30. Um, he says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers, and those whom he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. These verses are called the golden chain of salvation, okay, because it's an unbroken chain. It's also called the ordo salutis, which is Latin for the order of salvation. And that just simply deals with the logical sequence of the steps or stages involved in the salvation of a believer. And more importantly, it has to do with who made the first move in salvation. Now, this text is about salvation which starts with foreknowledge. And notice it's not what he foreknew, but it's whom he foreknew. Foreknew here is prognosco. The background of this term needs to be located in the Hebrew Scriptures, where for God <coughs> excuse me, to know doesn't refer to simple knowledge, but it refers to covenantal love. Foreknowledge is not referring to knowing facts, but God knowing people in an intimate, saving relationship. To know throughout the Tanakh is used of the most intimate relationships, including sex. Look at this in Genesis 4.1. Now Adam knew his wife Eve. Well, it's his wife. He should know her, shouldn't he? It's not used in that sense. What, look at, and she conceived and bare a child. Oh, so it must mean in a very intimate knowledge here. All right, it's used of sex, basically, here. Adam had sex with his wife, and she bore a child. But he used the word no because it had the idea of love. In the same way, God knew certain believers even before they were born, and he chose them for salvation. Look at uh, Jeremiah 1.5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nation. So God knew Jeremiah in a saving, intimate relationship and called him to be a prophet to the nations before he ever existed. Amos 3, 1 and 2. Hear this word that Yahweh has spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the whole family that I brought up out of the land of Egypt. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. What does that mean? God didn't know about the Canaanites? He didn't know about the Egyptians or the Syrians? It says, you only have I known. Well, if you use it as strictly knowledge, it doesn't work at all. But if it says, you only have I loved, that's what it means. He had a special relationship with Israel. They were his chosen nations. They're the only ones with whom, he says, I have an intimate, predetermined relationship. Psalm 1.6 for Yahweh knows the way of the righteous. Of course, He knows everything. But the way of the wicked will perish. So it's not saying that Yahweh just knows the righteous. He loves the righteous, all right? There's a love relationship there. This is a Hebrew parallelism. God loves the righteous, but the wicked will perish. Look at Matthew 7, 22 and 23. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Cast out demons in your name? Do many mighty works in your name? you got to understand here, their claim is what? Works. God, we're work. we worked hard. You should know. We should have a good relationship. We've been working really hard. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Again, God is omniscient. He knows who they are. He's saying, I never loved you. I don't have that relationship with you. It's not talking about knowledge because God knows everybody. It's talking about knowing them in a loving and a saving relationship. Let's go back to Romans 8. What I want you to see here is this chain is unbroken. For whom he foreknew, he loved beforehand, he predestined. So all he loved, he predestined. To be predestined for what? 
to be conformed to the image of His Son. In other words, to be in the family of God in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom He predestined, He called. That's the effectual call of God that is not resisted. God drew them to Himself. All He foreknew, He predestined and He called. And those whom He called, He justified. That's salvation. And those He justified, He glorified. Glorified is to be in the presence of God. People, this chain is unbroken. All He foreknew, He predestined to be like His Son. All He predestined, He called. All He called, He justified. All He justified, He glorified. There's no escaping here. No one gets out. No one loses out. Oh, I loved you in the beginning, but somehow we messed up along the way and you get out. No. All He foreknew, He predestined. Okay? These verses clearly teach that all who are called are justified. That tells us everybody's not called. Everybody's not foreknown. Everybody's not predestined. The call refers to election, God's choice in salvation. None are lost along the way. Love and election go together. All he foreknew, he glorified. Okay? No one misses out. That's why it's called the golden chain of salvation. That's why it's called the Ordo Salutis, the order of the salvation. All right, he says, those who are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. This ties election to foreknowledge. They're elect according to God's foreknowledge. Love and choosing go together. God chooses because God loves. He says this, because he loved your fathers and chose their offspring after them and brought you out of Egypt with his own presence by his great power. He loves, so he chose. He repeats that in Deuteronomy 7, 7 through 8. It was not because you were more in number than other people that Yahweh set his love on you and chose you. So he sets his love on them and then he chooses them. For you are the fewest of all peoples, but it's because Yahweh loves you. That's why he chose you. And is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that Yahweh was brought, has brought you with a mighty hand. Deuteronomy 7, well, finishing that, sentence, that section there, he says, And redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. To drive the point home, he repeats it again. In 10.15, he says, Yet Yahweh set his heart in, in love on your fathers and chose their offspring after them, you above all peoples, as you are this day. So God chooses who he loves. And listen, people, this will get people stirred up. He doesn't love everybody. If God chooses who he loves, and if he loved everybody, guess who he chose? Everybody. Okay, that's called universalism. That's not true. He doesn't love everybody. And because he doesn't love everybody, Christ did not die for everybody. Now, Galatians 2.20, I think, is a familiar verse. It's one that's memorized, often quoted by Christians. But I want to draw your attention to something maybe most people don't focus on in Galatians 2.20. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. I know it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul says, Christ loved me and he died for me. This is a critical element in the gospel of Christ. And notice that Paul tied Yeshua's love to him to his death for him. Christ died for the people he loved. So the question must be asked, who does Christ love? And for whom did he die? And the majority of believers today would say that God loves everybody. You know, smile, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Maybe not. But the majority of believers would say that. They would say that Christ died for all men. That's a commonly held belief. But is it biblical? See, I understand the Bible to teach that God does not love everybody. Now, I know that when you say that, people get upset. But I think it's clearly what the Bible teaches. Because look at uh, Romans 9.13. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. God didn't love Esau. You want to argue with that? I mean, that's what it says, okay? And people say, well, it means he, he didn't like him as much. No, it says he hated him. Love and hate, those are the opposites there, okay? Love and hate. And people want to argue about that, all right? Now, here's my question to you. Was Esau the only person that God didn't love? Think that's true? Maybe it's just one, one off, just Esau really got him mad before he was ever born, so he didn't choose him? 
The belief of our day is that God loves everybody. That's a modern belief. You can search the writings of the church fathers, the reformers, or the Puritans, and you will search in vain to find any such concept of God loving everybody. The fact is, the love of God is a truth for the saints. God loves His children. Not once in the four Gospels, other than John 3.16, and we'll talk about that in a second because that doesn't really count, but not once in the four Gospels do we read the Lord Yeshua telling sinners that God loves them. That's, that's most tracks, isn't it? God loves you, has a wonderful plan for your life. You know, it starts out with the love of God. You can't do that. They never, Christ didn't do it. The apostles didn't do it. If you get to the book of Acts, what is happening in Acts? They're taking the gospel to the world, to the nations, right? They're spreading out and taking the gospel. In the book of Acts, the love of God is never referred to at all. Does that seem strange? I mean, you know, we were taking the gospel out to the world, but the love of God is not mentioned. They never said that. Seems odd, huh? But when you come to the epistles, who are addressed to believers, the saints, then you get the full presentation of this truth. God's love is restricted to His own family. He loves all men. If He loves all men, then the distinction here is ridiculous. Look at what it says. For the Lord disciplines the one He loves. So does he discipline everybody? He disciplines his children. That's all he disciplines. If he loves all men, then the distinction here is just, it's ridiculous, meaningless. God only chastens whom he loves, which is a reference to believers, the elect. Well, how about John 3.16? I mean, everybody runs there. Yeah, look it. God so loved the world. He gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And people say, doesn't this prove that God loves everybody? No, remember he hated Esau? You must admit the Bible says that. Let's put this in a form of a syllogism, minor premise. God hated Esau. The Bible says that. Can't argue with that, okay? Minor premise. Esau's part of the world. Anybody want to argue with that? What would be the conclusion be? God doesn't love everyone in the world, okay? That's pretty simple, pretty basic, but people want to fight against that, okay? People, the word world here is not used to mean the entire human race. It's not everyone without distinction. God just loves every single person. The word world often has a relative rather than an absolute meaning. For example, look at Acts 19, 27. And there is danger, not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis, in some translations is also called Diana, may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be disposed from her magnificence, she whom Asia and all the world worships. Did everybody in Asia and the whole world worship Artemis? Would anybody make that argument? There was Christians at this time preaching the gospel. They didn't love her. So the whole world worships her, the text says. We know it doesn't mean every single person. That's a foolish argument because it's just, we know they're not all worshiping Diana here, okay? In John 3, Yeshua is talking to Nicodemus, who is a Jew, and the Jews had the belief that God loved only them. We're the special people of God. You can understand where they got that. He says in Deuteronomy, you only have I loved of all those families on the earth. All right, you're the only ones I knew, you're the only ones I loved. So that's where they got that from, but they didn't like Gentiles. They could, they could care less about Gentiles. And what John 3.16 is saying, that God's love is international in scope now. God loves Jews and he loves Gentiles. He loves the world. He loves everybody without distinction, whether they're Jew or Gentile, not without exception. Okay, the Bible clearly teaches that God is sovereign in the exercise of his love. Again, Ephesians 1, 4 and 5, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. So God made a choice before we were ever created. He made a choice that we should be holy and blameless before him. And then it says in love, he predestined us. He chooses those he loves. He predestined those he loves for adoption to himself as sons through Yeshua the Christ, according to the purpose of His will. So if what we have said so far is true, if God doesn't love everybody, but He loves His elect, (laughs) 
that we would understand that Christ did not die for anybody, everybody, but only those whom he loved. And Paul said in Galatians 2.20 that Christ died for him because he loved him. This is a truth taught through the Scripture. The Tanakh represents the Father as promising a certain reward for his suffering on behalf of sinners. He's promising the Son. You know, and often, especially in the book of John, we talk, it talks about those who have been given to the Son as a love gift. They were given. There's a group. They've been given to the Son. That's what Isaiah is talking about. Isaiah 53, 10 and 11. Yet it was the will of Yahweh to crush him, speaking of Christ. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of Yahweh shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Now he says, he shall see his offspring. That's a reference to the elect of God. God has given those elect to Christ. We are children of promise. Notice that it says he will see and be satisfied, not frustrated, he is satisfied through the suffering, the anguish the son goes through, and he's going to make many to be accounted, not all, many to be accounted as righteous. Matthew 1, She shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Yeshua, for he will save his people from their sins. There are two things in this verse that we need to understand. First, Yeshua did not come to save all men. He came to save his people. Now, the Reformers called this limited atonement. It doesn't mean that Christ's death was limited in power, was limited in scope or purpose. In other words, he didn't die for all humanity. He died for his people. Next, this phrase will save his people. And, and I know that you know, a lot of the I.O. people want to say, well, this means only Jews. No, he's not talking just about Jews. His people are, goes way beyond Jews. If you're familiar with the Scripture, you should understand that. All right, He loves the world, Jews and Gentiles. All right. So it says he's going to save his people. And notice that the angel did not say he's going to offer salvation to the people. Offering salvation implies you could reject that. You could say, no, thank you. This verse plainly states he will save his people, emphasizes a complete work for his people, only accomplished by Christ and Christ alone. Now, Yeshua taught that he was not going to die for all humanity. He said, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Not all. Matthew 16, 28. For this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Yeshua came to give his life as a ransom, to pour out his blood for many. John 10, 14 and 15. I'm the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. Who are the sheep? Is every human being a sheep? Or do sheep only refer to his elect? In Matthew 25, 32 34, it says, Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Okay, sheep on the right, goats on the left. You got that? Then the king will say to those on the right, who's that? The sheep. Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom. So the sheep get to inherit the kingdom from the foundation of the world. All right? Those who are sheep inherit the kingdom, but the goats go into everlasting fire. As we saw in John 10, 15, Yeshua laid down his life for his sheep, not the goats. Christ died for his sheep. John 6, 65. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it's granted him by my Father. Now, there's three things in this verse I want to pull out. First of all, the phrase, no one. That's a universal negative. That says, nobody comes. No, no Jews, no Gentiles, nobody comes. All right? No one. The second are the words, come to me. If you look at this chapter and go through it, come to me is, a, is synonymous with believing in me. All right? He talks about that earlier, all right? So no one can come. No one can believe in me. This has to do with the ability of man. Yeshua was saying, no one, neither Jew nor Gentile, has the ability to believe in me. And lastly, he says, unless. This is a necessary condition. Yeshua said that the necessary condition for someone coming to him was God giving it to them. 
What does God give them? He gives them the ability. Simply put, God gives man the ability to come to Christ. Man on his own does not have that ability. Man on his own does not care about God, okay? That's the thing, you know, people hear this stuff and they go, you know, someone foolishly said last week, this compares to rape. I'm like, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard of, okay? First of all, here's what you have to understand. God makes the unwilling willing, okay? That's what he does. So, you know, it's, someone once, we were talking, I was talking to this lady once, and she was describing Calvinism as, well, God drags people to Christ. And I said, no, you got that all wrong, okay? God makes their heart willing, they come to Christ. What about those who aren't called? They don't care. Well, the Bible says, whosoever will may come. That's right, if you want, come. Because the only reason you're going to want to is if God put in your heart. If he hadn't put in your heart, you're not going to want to. You don't care about God. That's what the Bible teaches. No man seeks after God, all right? God gives man the ability, ability that man does not have on his own. Now, our minds, sadly, have been conditioned to think of the cross as a redemption that does less than redeem. And if Christ is a Savior who does less than save, and if God's love is a weak affection which cannot keep anyone from wrath without their help, and if the faith is a human help which God needs for His purpose, that is not the gospel, people. The gospel is that God saves sinners. God Himself saves the sinful. He does that on His own. He chooses them, He calls them, He brings them into His family. And again, those who are not called... They don't care. They don't care because no one seeks after God. There's none righteous. They go about their merry way and they're happy going about it. Others, he puts something in their heart. I wasn't searching for God. I can tell you that. That's the last thing I cared about. I was having a great time. I was in the party phase. You know, I was out of school, had a full-time job, could afford all the alcohol I wanted to get. And so I was just living it up, you know. And I, was, I remember telling jokes about Christ and, you know, Stuff falling through the hand, his hands because of the holes in his hands and stuff. And it was just, you know, it was blasphemous. And then all of a sudden, bang! Someone gives me a track and I read it because I think it's a comic book. That's the only reason I read it. It looked like a little comic book, Chick Vocation Tracks. They still put them out today. You know, it's funny, people always put these in the bathroom. I guess it's because people are looking for something to read or something, you know? You go in the bathroom, you get a Chick track. You, you get saved in the bathroom, okay? I read that track and literally my life changed. I, I didn't know what was going on. I was really frustrated, scared. You know, I didn't understand, you know. And I'm not blaming Kathy, but we were walking through the mall, and she did something, and I got aggravated, and I said, God damn you. And then I stopped, and I was like, I felt like I got pierced through the heart. And I was like, what? why did that bother me? I never, I'd say it all the time, never bothered me. I had changed and wasn't trying to change, you know. I got my Bible off the shelf that I had I, when I graduated sixth grade from the Presbyterian Church. They gave me a Bible, and I had a communion cup sitting on top of it, and when I pulled the communion cup off, there's a little dust to stick around the communion cup, <laughs> dusted it off and said, and I got on my knees and I said, God, I don't know if you're real. I don't know anything. About, if there's any truth to any of this, teach me. I opened up the Bible to Matthew. I had a rough time with the first chapter. Everybody begat somebody. I was like, I don't even know what begat is, okay? But once I got through chapter one, I was rolling, okay? And I'm like, okay, this is a story. I didn't have, I never had a clue what was in that book. It's a story. Read through the Gospels, I'm like, this is pretty good, you know? And it just, it transformed my life. I would go back to the guy who gave me the track and said, okay, look, I had a problem with my language. It was terrible, you know? I went back to him and said, look, you, you, something changed in you, you quit cussing, what happened? How, how do I do that? He said, I just went and asked God to take it away from me. I'm like, that doesn't sound like it'll work. Yeah. I went home that night and I prayed, Lord, I know my mouth is bad. I know stuff that comes out of it is not good. I ask you to change my life. And never cussed again. Until yeah. just a minute ago. <laughs> 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 no, I mean, it was, I was really, I was transformed by that. I just, it, it was gone, you know. And Because I, I, I was a simple young Christian and I just believed, just ask God. Just trust God. You know, and it was just an amazing journey, but it was nothing that I, like I said, nothing I planned, nothing I wanted, nothing I sought after. I didn't care. I was raised in church. As soon as I was old enough to get out from my parents' authority and not go, I didn't go. because It was terribly boring to me. Well, I found out the church we were going to was Presbyterian Church. They didn't have a clue who God was, so probably why it was so boring, you know. 
I went back to them and said, you understand about the gospel and preach the gospel to the ministers there, you know. I preached, Kathy was Catholic, so I got to preach to a lot of Catholics too. That was fun. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Yeah, well, it wasn't too fun for them, but I think it opened Kathy's eyes to see that I, at, at six months as a Christian, I understood the Bible more than these priests did, you know. And so it was kind of opened her eyes, and she's like, okay, I think you, this makes sense, you know. Now, I got married. She was an unbeliever. I hadn't made it to Corinthians yet. I didn't know I was supposed to marry an unbeliever. I didn't know that. But again, God's gracious. And when I left for boot camp, I made her promise she would read her Bible every day. And she said she would. About halfway through boot camp, she writes me a letter saying, I trusted Christ today. God's got a plan, people. He fulfills it. So it's been amazing. And uh, that was the greatest gift God ever gave me besides my salvation was her because next to the Holy Spirit, she's pretty right there to keep me in line. So I thank the Lord for that. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love for us, Lord, and your grace that's so amazing, Lord. It's just hard to understand. Thank you for all you do for us, Lord. Thank you for caring, teaching, moving us. Father, open our hearts to the Word of God, Lord. We just pray you teach us the truth, Father. We might follow you, we might love you, we might walk with you in every area. Amen. All right. Now, let me qualify this. Question time, okay? It's four questions, all right? We're not going to get into debate here. If you want to debate me, set up a time, and we'll debate this whole doctrine. But, but I'm looking for questions right now to try to clarify what I said. Whoa. You know, people say, did you mean this, or you said this, or did, what did you mean? From Norm, David almost got a nosebleed entering verse 2. So much treasure in God's Word. Thanks. Yeah, you know, I mean, I had no idea what the verse, this, where we're going in verse 2 until I started getting into it. And I'm like, wow, this is it's tying in with the elect. Because uh, I'm reading according to, if you just take the verse by itself, according to, da, da, what's it according to? You know, it's kata. That takes us back somewhere. We've got to go back up and find out. Well, it's tying in with the elect. We're elect according to this. All right. And we're not done. I guess you picked that up, right? We got several more, prop, two more propositions in verse 2 to deal with. Dean from California, man wasn't created to be fully autonomous being. Walking by faith in God was built into Adam. Disobedience brought full autonomy. Boy, what a mess. Yeah, that's the thing, people. We are called to walk in fellowship with God. Here's the thing. When we're walking in fellowship with Him, life is just amazing. I mean, it's, it's beyond amazing because you're in fellowship with God, and nothing is going to rock your world. When people let circumstances rock their world, I don't think they're really walking in fellowship, okay? Because we talked about this, I guess it was last week, I can do all things through Christ. That doesn't mean you can do whatever you want to. It means that if you can deal with any circumstance of life if you're walking in fellowship. Such an important principle. In all honesty, humbleness, and meekness, thank you for confirming what I have diligently read and labored over for a long time. Feels rewarding. Thanks, Gary and Chris from Pennsylvania. The argument of when life begins is easily answered. They say life begins at conception. God knows us before we were formed in the womb, and our days are ordained before one of them comes to be. So conception begins in the mind of God long before it physically happens. Yeah, I agree. I mean, God knew, knew us from eternity past. That's hard enough to think about, okay? And try to think about eternality. God never had a beginning. Don't think about that too long, though, because they'll, they'll lock you up probably, okay? Because I just, I mean, my mind can't grab that. No begin I can grasp no end. I don't know why, but somehow I can grasp that. But I can't grasp never having a beginning. Uh, P.S., your message answered my question and confirmed my belief, but is the strong, sobering truth. Praise Yahweh. I think I missed something here. Oh, yeah, there's two parts to this. That's why I don't read the P.S. first. Uh, this is uh, from Judd from Rich, uh, Richmond, Texas. Grace and peace, Pastor David. Question, does God love those who are not chosen? No, and that's what I said. I don't believe I, God's love is to his elect, and his elect are always chosen. Comment, FYI, a good translation for the, from the NIT Bible for John 3.16. It says, for this is the way God loved the world. He gave his one and only son 
so that everyone who believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Okay, much different than God's loving the world as a blanket statement. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. Thanks, Judd. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Does all mean all, or is it used in two different ways? It is used in two different ways, and in the same way in Romans. He uses all and many, and he goes back and forth on that, and it is very confusing. I understand that. I dealt with that in Romans 5. You can go look that up because I can't remember what I said, to tell you the truth, all right? But I studied it out at that time, and I'm like, oh, yeah, the many and the all, it's, you know. But here's one thing that we, I want you to see from 1 Corinthians, all right? Adam is a type. Who's the anti-type? Christ. All right, we sinned in Adam because Adam's a federal head. Well, guess what? Christ is a federal head, too, and so we're righteous in him. And if you don't like Adam's being a federal head, then what about Christ being the federal head? They go together. Adam is a type. Christ is the anti-type. The appendix, the meaning of foreknew in Romans 8, 29, the five points of Calvinism by Steele and Thomas is worth the price of the book itself. Exactly what you said this morning. All glory go to God. Aaron from Minnesota. Thanks, Aaron. I appreciate it. Yeah, that text in Romans, like I said, it just, it's an unbroken chain. There's no, who he did this, he did this. If he foreknew you, you're going to be glorified. That's the bottom line, okay? Uh, love your thinking outside the box. I don't even know what a box is, okay? <laughs> By the way, sorry I didn't follow up with yet. yet I'm, oh, okay. <laughs> That's personal. Never mind. <laughs> um. How does this affect how we preach the gospel to all the world? How do you know who God's elect are? Rick and Pam from Merritt Island. That's a good question. I appreciate that question because that's what I'm looking for, stuff like that. All right, how does it affect the preach? I'm just going to tell you my personal opinion. It makes it so much better for me, okay? I was raised in this idea that, you know, you preach the gospel to everybody. Okay, when I was in college, I had a course on evangelism. You had to preach that week to so many people, you know, which is like, oh, forced evangelism. I got to get my people in. At toll booths, I'd be preaching to the, that guy at the toll booth, and they'd be like, cars behind me waiting, you know. Well, I got to get my seven in this week, you know. But then it, it freed me up to realize, if this is God's work, it's not mine. I don't walk around guilty anymore. I remember we had a repairman come and work on our refrigerator, and I didn't preach to him. And he left, and I felt, oh, now if he goes to hell... His blood's on my hands, you know. No, no, God is sovereign over that, okay? I didn't, it, it frees you from guilt, I think. Are we supposed to still preach the gospel? Yes, and it's exciting to preach the gospel, and it's exciting to see someone respond to it when you're preaching it. You know, when you just tell people, listen, we are all born sinners. We're separated from a holy God. But if you'll trust what Christ did for you, if you will believe that Christ died on the cross to, for your sins and you put your trust in Him, He will redeem you. He will give you everlasting life. That's exciting. And, and people would get saved, and I'd be so excited about it. And then I'd ask myself, why do I get so excited about that? I'm not getting a commission or anything. You know, but I act like I was because I was just excited that, you know, you see people come to life. You can preach the gospel to somebody and nothing. They blow it off. Uh, I don't care. You can preach the same person maybe a year later and boom, okay? They come to life, all right? Because just because somebody's elect, they have to come to Christ at a point in time in their life. And whatever that point in time is, they hear the gospel, they come to Christ. You might be the one sharing it with them. That's a pretty awesome privilege that we have to share the gospel. So I don't, I don't think it should... Spurgeon said... If, you, if, you, if God would put a yellow stripe down the back of every elect, I would lift up their shirts and know who to preach to. But since we don't know that, we preach to everybody. You know, it's not your business who's elect and who's not elect. You just preach the gospel, okay? That's, that's what God called you to do. Preach the gospel. God will take care of the rest. Uh, Leela from Arizona says, You have been such a blessing. Your teaching has opened my eyes. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I embraced this doctrine before I became a preterist, and both are so much in harmony. I agree with you on that, okay? Oh, I agree on that. Uh, are these two? Yeah, these two are together. Though I believe every word you have preached and have for many years, it's always good to be refreshed. Thank you. I appreciate you watching. appreciate you putting a question in. Norm, you coming back again at me? Norm again. 
This is one of the best testimonies I've ever heard. God bless your sweet wife. <laughs> yes, thank you, you know. I told her she must have been really bad in a former life to get stuck with me, but, you know. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I don't believe in reincarnation, all right, boy. There's a sound bite someone's going to pull, and, you know. Curtis believes in reincarnation, all right. JP from Oregon. Thank you again, Pastor Dave. Oftentimes, I'm brought to tears knowing that God chose me. Knowing how rotten I am, it's so humbling, and I'm forever grateful. I, I, I agree with you, JP, 100%. It is very humbling. Like I said, at first I was very confused. What is God doing in my life? Um, I came in late today. Oh, shame on you. I told you to lock the doors, Gary. Came in late today. But any preaching from David is good stuff. Thanks, Pastor David. <laughs> Great message today. Thanks. Um, you know, you just pick it up right afterwards. It's online, so you can, you can grab it and catch up. John Mark from Northern California. Since salvation is all the work of God, why do some apostles in the New Testament tell the saints of various churches that salvation was theirs provided they didn't fall away, that they needed to endure until the end? I believe this is where Arminians get their doctrine, losing salvation. Blessings to all. Anybody who believes anything is going to try to back it up with a verse or two, right? I mean, that's just, you know, you're not going to, hopefully, you're not going to make something up out of nowhere and have nothing to even come close to back it up. Yeah, there are verses like this that, you know, you question that. And what's going on here? And there are stuff's happening in the transition period that haven't happened since. And their salvation was not full, it was not complete until the Lord returned in AD 70, bringing salvation to a completion. They were in the already but not yet. All right, they didn't have it yet. All right, they're waiting for it. They're waiting for Christ to return out of the temple, telling the sacrifice was accepted, redemption is complete. So until that happened, they were in that state. But here's another thing that we have to understand, and I think um, it's confusing about salvation. We see the word save, sozo, salvation, soteria. We see that and we think eternal life. That's not how a Hebrew saw it, okay? They saw salvation as rescue from danger predominantly, okay? And that's what trips a lot of people up. And so you have to understand, and it's used both ways in, in the New Testament, okay? Paul said to the people on the ship, unless you remain on the boat, you cannot be saved. There's a church out there somewhere, the boat people. <laughs> we're on the boat and we're saved, okay? I mean, you, you got to understand that that's how, and, and a lot of people get tripped up over that, you know, because they see these different scriptures on salvation. And they're like, oh, they can lose it. No, you're not going to lose your salvation because if God saved you, you know, that, again, if you think you can lose it, you don't understand it. All right. How do many people find fame in the world when they are not called and chosen? God is not in any of that, even though he has, clear, he has clearly chose not to save them. I'm not sure what we're talking about here. In all honesty, humble and meekness, I thank God for confirming I have given labor over. Okay. How does how do so many people find fame in the world? I don't know. Well, I think a lot of people, you don't really want my thoughts on that, okay? I believe a lot of these people who are in the entertainment industry and people who are famous are there because the cabal put them there because they need the message put out that they're putting out. So I know that's just my, I know I'm a conspiracy theorist, but appreciate your thoughts and your understanding. Understanding, may God bless your efforts. It has been a blessing to me. Thanks. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. appreciate you watching. Good to have you. All right, questions here. Okay. John 3.16, um, I don't know if you ever read John Piper's book, uh, Five, was it the Five Senses of the Love of God? No. I'm not sure, but he, so he gives five senses of the love of God as if the word love of God is taken in different senses. It's not always the same, it's not okay. flying away. So John 3.16 is one that he qualifies, and this is how I've understood it, even as a Calvinist, uh, was that it's saying that the manner in which God loves the world um, is different. Like he even says it, the manner in which he loves the world is different than he loves his own kind of thing. So how I understand what's being said there is he doesn't love the world, you know, the wicked, unbelieving world as uh, in the same sense that he loves his own. And the illustration that Piper gives is sort of like when you go to a soccer game with your kids, you see all the kids on the field playing soccer and you love them all, but you got your eye on 
one particular right. kid who's your own. Yeah. There's so there's a different sense in which you know love is used, and it seems to me that that John is making a distinction of the, the way that God loves. So I think you know God wants, as He says in other places, God wants unbelievers to come to Him and, and follow His condition for salvation. And he's saying that I, I love the world in a sense and that I've provided for them, but I don't think he's saying I love them as my own. So there's a distinction. Well, I agree with that. I agree there's different areas, different aspects of the love of God, but in that text, it's tied with salvation. It's directly tied with salvation. And something that you remind me of something that somebody brought up. They brought up First Peter or Second Peter 3 9 about, you know, God is not willing that any perish. And they'll throw that verse. See, God doesn't want anybody to perish, but it all will come to repentance. And I'm like, okay. Who is the any there that God doesn't want to perish? Is it everybody? Because here's the problem. You just told me that God's sitting in heaven saying, oh man, I don't want them to perish, but there they go. Another one's flipped off. And God is up there frustrated and he's wringing his hands and he's so upset because he wants something he can't have. That is not the God of the Bible. All right? That is not the God of the Bible. That's not the God of my Bible, okay? God is sovereign. He gets what he wants. That text in, in Peter... We'll get to that in a year, probably, because it's the second theater, all right? But he says, not willing that any. Who are the any? You go back into the antecedent to find out what that antecedent is. He's talking about the elect. He's not willing that any of the elect should perish, because they're saying, where's the promise of his coming? How come he's not here yet? God's still working this out in the transition period. It's not over yet. He's not willing that any of these perish. And we see the same thing in Matthew 24. He shortened those days for the elect's sake. So again, we got to take everything in the New Testament and the Old, combine it together and make a plan out of that. You can't pick and choose these verses, okay? It's easy to do that. So, Lord. so John 3.16, is is that about just just the elect, that, that early group before 70 AD? And does cosmos mean still mean world and universe? Well, that's a good question, you know, because there's people who say, well, okay, that, that only refers to those before AD 70. And here's my question. Did the nature of man change after 87? No. So why would that change? You know, if the nature of man didn't change, he's still dead in trespasses and sins. He still needs God to do something, okay? That's how I see it. You know, because people say, oh, that all changed. Well, there's no more. The elect were only Israel. No, they weren't only Israel. All right, he writes to the Thessalonians. They're elect, okay? God chose you for salvation. He tells the Thessalonians, I chose you for salvation. So that's, you know, the other argument, well, he just chooses for service. He chooses for both. <coughs> They're both found in there, okay? We just have to put the whole package together. Yes? You have really made my head just I like... know. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, She's was... visiting today, so... <laughs> um, and I, I did Torah study for six years, so, you know, coming out of Christian science and, and getting into that was just it was so exciting to really ponder and delve into God's word and I mean I just learned so much about his character but mm. I'm just trying to wrap my head around you know wanting to know him better it's like I, I think about it as a if you're an artist and you're you're painting and um, there's a lot going in here but it's like if he's he is the master he's the one who casts all the the roles on the stage the, the state the world and he knows what each part they're going to play. And then, you know, we, we're here in the flesh for, it's a very short time, yes, you know? And that he has a, a plan and a purpose for each role to play. So what, what I heard you saying according to the quotes and the word is that within us, it's like a, a seed. Like he knows what the seed is going to bring forth. We don't know that. We may be the one that waters it, that shines a little light on it with the word of encouragement, but we're not the one that brings forth the manifestation of what he has already designed within. Is that a good metaphor? Yeah, that's or? what Paul said. You know, someone planted, I watered, God gives the increase. It's up yeah. to God. We all play our part, you know, we're sharing with others, you know, and here's, I think we'd be a lot better at evangelism if we lived the Christian life better. Okay? <laughs> Because we think we'd be a testimony, first of all, that people are looking at and hey, that what you do, you know, how do you do how do you live like that? You know, that's important. So yes, if we could live out, I think Luke. So if God doesn't love everybody, 
Why does he command us to love our neighbors and our enemies? Because he's God and he can do that. See, God can do whatever he wants. He's not bound by any any things like, like we are, okay? We're bound by stuff because he tells us that. You know, he does things like he wants to do. But I think, and I know it's the common belief, but I, I hope, I just showed you many verses, God doesn't love everybody, okay? It's just not a thing, you know, and it, I think it's because people can't stand God doing that. He's not fair. God is not, he's not bound by anything. There's no one holds God accountable. Hey, what did you do? This? You know, we saw it in Romans 9. Are you going to argue with the potter? Isn't God bound by his own character, though? His character, yeah, but, he, but I mean, no one's there to hold him accountable. Consistent with what he commands. I think his character is very consistent. With what know? he commands us, though, because like we're made in his image, we're, we're kind of like right. him. So it seems that like what he commands us to do is a reflection of his own character, because that's what he wants. That's his economy. So it seems like a contradiction. It may seem like a contradiction, but he, you know, I'm telling you, you know, he, we are commanded to love our enemies. Okay, which is incredible. And here's the thing. You can't love your enemy unless you have the power of God dwelling in you. You can't do that, okay? That's supernatural, all right? So God has to give us the power to do that. Why doesn't he love his enemies? I don't know, but just go read through Judges and find out how many people God slaughters and destroys. You know, my wife was talking about, you know, how t hard it is for her when you go in there and kill the women, kill the children, kill everybody. He's trying to wipe out the Nephilim. All right, there's a purpose for it. We don't understand so much of God's mind. All we know is what he's showed us. And that we have to go by that, all right? Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong to God. Yep. But those that are revealed, people miss the last part, but those that are revealed are for us and our children forever. So we're supposed to know what's revealed, but there's a, in the mind of God, there's so many things we're never going to know. Anthony? He desired us to do and become what he desired us to do. You know, if we spent more time focusing on that aspect that we're called to love one another, a lot of things would be a lot better, you know? You know? Garrett? God loves everybody, but it's, you know, it, it, sun shines on all, rains on all. And, and that's what he's talking about, the different aspects of love that yeah. Mike was talking about. Yes, yeah. God, in the sense that if, if you're breathing, you're experiencing the love of God in the sense that you're alive and you're moving. Okay? Well, that's not... John three sixteen love. John three sixteen love is redemptive. Uh, yes, I believe. Redemptive. I believe that is redemptive. Yes. You know, when I was struggling with this back, I guess in the eighties, I read a really a great book by A. W. Pink, The Sovereignty of God. Yes, A. W. Pink's book is strong, very strong. But uh, you want a stronger book? The Bible. R. C. Sproul. Oh. R. C. Sproul Jr. It's called Almighty Over All. It is the best book, I think, on the sovereignty of God. I'll, and I'm not friends with Sproul. He hates, he hates preterists. I tried to talk to him at a conference. He hates is a strong word. Well, he, let, tell, let me he tell you, if you, he hates, okay? No doubt about it. And uh, I tried to talk to him at a conference, you know, to question him about some of his beliefs. He ran like a little girl. I'm like, dude, just, you know, stop. he's a powerful writer, but in presence, he's like, little mouse or something you know but that book almighty overall because you know he, one of the chapters called who done it and he talks about the fall of man it's powerful because he goes to who could have done it who had the ability to do this was it satan was it eve was it adam who you know it's just i highly recommend almighty overall by rc Sproul jr jr was a super lapsarian his dad was not his dad was a, you know <laughs> one day rc Sproul senior was asked you know about sin you know, where did sin come from? And he says, I don't know, ask my son. He knows. <laughs> and I said, hey, you're right. I agree with that. You did. Your son I can answer that. that. <laughs> yeah. So we're told to hate our father and mother and serve Christ. Yep. So we can examine that word, hate. If, you know, God hated my Esau, but loved Jacob. I always just chose Jacob's line to bring us Christ. Jesus, you know. Um, he chose Abraham. So why would he have to hate Esau because he well, was choosing one? Well, I'm saying, why don't we do what we do with other passages and examine that word hate and just instead of using it as our... Well, how you would examine it, I would say, would go back to Malachi where he uses it and he talks about Esau have a hated, and he talks about the destruction that he brought on Esau because of his hatred. All right, so, so Malachi helps us teach, understand that word, okay? Well, what about, so I should hate my parents? Yeah. Well, it, yeah, it means in the sense that you, compared to Christ, you have got to, you can't follow them. And when, you, when you're following Christ, you're putting away all these other things, okay? And following Him. There's more facets to a word. He chose 
Well, I agree yeah. there is more facets to a word. And we don't know, like, Asa yeah. probably did a lot of things to make God angry. Wait, you he know? talks about before they were born, okay? So you can't even come with that stuff. Before they were born, he chose one and over the other. That's because God can do what he wants. Uh, amen. That's my point. That's my whole point, yes. Pilar, is that right? No. Pilar. Pilar. Yes. Pilar. So what, what she was saying with hate, too, because when, I, when we were doing the, the Torah study, this came up and we were talking about, you know, how Jesus used parables to illustrate a point, and right. it could be heard, taken literally, um, figuratively, metaphorically, and how there are types and foreshadowings of Christ. And so, um, just, again, I'm just grappling with this, but, so with Esau or anyone like him, a type of a fleshly man, someone who didn't value the birthright and what that meant, someone who preferred to feed himself, you know, to feed his belly rather than his heart or soul. And I think it begs the question, you know, kind of like with Ishmael that Hagar, he, he blessed her. He's like, you're not going to be left. You're not forsaken. And there is a, it's like, you're always welcome. You're, you know, you get to choose. So I, I, I guess I have kind of a question or a problem or issue. I mean, tell me God, like, if we're predestined, where is the choice? Where is That's the... That's last week I talked on that. <laughs> oh, okay, I gotta go back to that. Go back to last week. You can get it online, all right? Okay. Uh, all right, I got a few more here uh, from the online com community. Good message, Pastor Dave. I appreciate the clarification in Joe. Oh, is this from? Yeah, from a different day. Oh, my word. All right, today he says, the blessing to me, where did you buy your coffee cup? <laughs> Okay, I didn't buy my coffee cup. It was a gift. Someone sent me as a gift, so I have no clue where it came from. Um, just, uh, yeah, okay. I know there's a lot of questions now. It's a flat earth coffee cup. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I love it. Proclaiming the truth of God's creation. All right. This is Mike Vincent from, uh, he says, For my first 30 years as a believer, I used to believe I could reject, not lose, my salvation because I believe God gave us free will. I hear you, Mike. I believe I would also say I don't see how it's possible after Christ poured his life and love into me. I really don't know or understand Calvinism. However, over time and listening to your teaching, it became clear that I really was am a Calvinist. Now, I'm not Calvinist. I'm Augustinian. Remember that, okay? Because Augustine taught Calvin. You're Calvinist. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Double predestination. <laughs> However, over time, I listened to your teaching and became clear that I really am a Calvinist and no longer believe I'm able to reject my salvation. Great job teaching, David. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate you joining us this morning. By God's grace, we are not just watching, we are participating. Well, thank you. I, I like that, too. And, and again, let me encourage you, if you're, if you're watching live, go in the chat room on Rumble and meet other people there, and maybe you'll find someone in your neighborhood, someone close that you can actually have some fellowship with. Um, okay, this is from Vic in Northern Ireland. Now, Vic, I apologize to you. I, when I get texts, and I don't know why, from out of the country, I can't respond. That's on Google Voice. This is Google Voice is what I use to take the questions, and so for some reason I can't. But I can I can respond to you right now. Northern Ireland. Hey, this is St. Patrick's Day. It's good to have someone. <laughs> someone from Northern Ireland call texting on St. Patrick. He says the Arminian view splits the Trinity and puts them at odds with one another. For if God the Father decreed all should be saved, and Christ accomplished it, but the Holy Spirit says, I'm not going to draw this one or that person. Then the Holy Spirit are divided. Well, yes, I agree with you, Vic. When you understand the whole the aspects, and we're going to get into that in the next coming weeks. Well, next week, Rick Welsh is going to be here speaking from the boroughs of Berea. So Rick will be here speaking next week. The following week after that is that holiday they call uh, Resurrection Day. Okay? I don't call it Easter because Easter is the name of a pagan god. All right, John uh, John says, God feeds ISIS on their way to behead Christians. 
Is that a different category of love toward the world? Again, you know, you're experiencing the love of God if you're eating, if you're breathing, if you're alive, because apart from God, you can do any of that stuff, okay? So yeah, there's, I mean, it's amazing. If you're familiar with the Bible, you know God raises up evil people to do work for him, okay? How that, and then he judges them afterwards, you know? I'll get your book when it comes to your website. I don't like Amazon. Sorry, it's never coming to my website. I don't think. Is it, Jeff? We don't sell stuff on the website. No, we don't sell stuff on the website. We give stuff away, okay? So, uh, sure. Here, we'll give you a book. but I'll have it at the conferences. I mean, I'd love to wanted to start selling through PayPal or something, but. Well, don't we have a store on the website for merch? No, it's not for books and stuff. It's just for those t-shirts. Okay. And we don't sell those either. They go I don't. Stores. I don't know what the name of this is. Or this person is. But how about in Phoenix? Any share your thought? Your thoughts? I don't know. I don't know, hopefully someone in Phoenix <laughs> shares my thoughts, but if you go on the, like I said, go, when you're in Rumble, go in the chat room and ask the people there. And if you're, if you're watching on Rumble, I would encourage you to go to the chat room. You have to get an account with Rumble. It doesn't cost anything. You just, you know, join Rumble. They only track the people that are, have an account with them. In other words, if you see the number on Rumble, that number is only the people who have an account. People who, you can just, anybody can watch, but they're not counted in the account, from my understanding. So... You know, if you're if you're on Rumble, join it. Get in the chat room. You can talk to one another. You know, really want to try to promote fellowship. You have to All have right. an account to get into the chat room, though. You, yes. You can, you can watch without chatting. Right. You can watch, but you have to have an account to get in the chat room. Okay. Join All right. I'm going to wrap this up, people. Appreciate your uh, your uh, patience, your endurance, your long suffering, staying with us. This, again, Rick will be here next week, so I encourage you. To, Rick is going to do something very interesting next week. And I'm really excited to hear it. He's taken my idea of Lazarus writing the Gospel of John, and he's going beyond. How far beyond, I don't know, but he's going beyond. I, I, you know, just the way Rick sees things is, is amazing. You know, he'll bring thought, things to your mind you never thought of before. And you'll be like, why have I never thought of that? He's got a very unique way, so next week he'll be preaching here. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thanks for the opportunity to be here with family. Lord, thank you. Just the opportunity for us to join together. And look at your word together. Lord, strengthen us, encourage us. May we be excited, Lord, about your word and excited about sharing it with others. Thank you, Father. Amen. Have a blessed week, people. We'll see you next week.